everybody. Welcome to our fourth and final um, session of our Discovering the Delaware webinar series. Um, we're really happy to have you on this kind of dark and stormy night. We're hoping that there's no you know, power outages because of the thunderstorm, but bear with us if we do have technical issues. Um, if you haven't been able to join us for our past sessions, uh, we, we've been covering everything from the history of the Delaware River to the ecology of the river to art that has been inspired by the Delaware River. So we've had a really um, diverse group of speakers so far. And tonight to finish things off, we have two really great speakers um, to send us on our way. Um, today we'll be covering um, an, uh, the history of activism in protecting the Delaware River watershed and keeping our river clean and safe for everybody. And then we'll be um, shifting gears a little bit to hear about kayaking on the river, some basic kayaking safety, as well as hearing about the, um, the tour, the, the route that we'll be taking on our on the water kayak educational experience. So to start us off, we have Tracy Carluccio to talk about a history of activism in the Delaware River. Tracy is the deputy director of the Delaware Riverkeeper Network, where she has worked as an environmental advocate since 1989. Delaware Riverkeeper Network is a nonprofit membership organization working throughout the entire length and breadth of the Delaware River watershed to defend its outstanding values and restore them where needed. Tracy works for the Watersheds Protection in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, and Delaware, addressing issues that include water quality, healthy habitats and communities, environmental regulation and policy, clean, efficient, and renewable energy, and biodiverse ecosystems. Tracy's work includes advocacy in opposition to fossil fuel development, including fracking and other extractive industries regarding PFAS water quality issues since 2005, and has commented and written extensively on community and regulatory matters. Her service includes 16 years as a member of the New Jersey Water Protection and Planning Council and on nonprofit and government boards. And before I turn it over to Tracy, I just wanna let you all know that we are recording tonight's session. So you're welcome to turn your video on or off, but we do ask you to stay on mute um, until the question and answer period. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tracy. Thank you so much. Okay, can you see my screen, Maria? Okay, great. Thank you all for joining tonight. Uh, tonight we're going to take a look at the Delaware River Watershed's geography of fracking. Uh, I'm sorry, geography of activism. And we're gonna take a little bit of a tour um, of the Delaware River watershed. And to do that, I wanted to show a picture just to remind everybody of where we are. Um, the Delaware River uh, joins New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. And it's an undammed river. It's the largest um, east of the Mississippi. It's one of the largest undammed rivers in the United States today. It's also a wild and scenic river. It uh, is about a 13 square mile watershed and about 330 miles long. The main stem of the river begins in New York where the east and west branches join together at Hancock and then it flows along the boundary of New York and Pennsylvania, goes between New Jersey and Delaware then into the Delaware Bay and finally to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, the, the Delaware is the longest stretch of anti-degradation waters in the United States. And what that means is that the entire 197 mile non-tidal river is protected by a special regulatory program uh, under the Delaware River Basin Commission. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we, as we move ahead. But in order for us to take a look at the, the geography, uh, if you will, of activism, we're gonna look at how community engagement by grassroots and frontline organizations has shaped the history and the future of the Delaware River and also the world that we know here today. Um, so let's look at and ask this basic question. Uh, why does it matter? Well, uh, the blood, sweat and tears 
um, of thousands and thousands of people who have taken part in the protection of the Delaware River over the years has been for many different reasons. But let's just look simply at this clockwise, starting from the right. Human health and the quality of life, the protection um, and support that we need in order to have a diverse, a socially just and healthy communities. And then moving down the fulfillment of our right to clean air. Um, and we all breathe and we all need air to survive and its quality directly affects us. And then next, the provision of clean drinking water and food. The Delaware River provides drinking water to up to 17 million people every single day. And that includes New York City, as well as the metropolitan area all around Philadelphia. And then next is the enjoyment and connection of the river, people and the river connecting together in order to appreciate its natural treasures. And that natural world is something that we need in order to enrich our lives, but also in order to look at the last piece, which are the communities that are non-human, those that, are, that require habitats that are healthy and biologically diverse in order to provide living, uh, living conditions where not only species can survive, but can thrive. And we, we really have to take action for those who can't take action for themselves and many times we're like the Lorax, and I speak for the trees, or I speak for the fish. And that's part of what the activism has been about in the Delaware River watershed. So the first thing that we're gonna look at is in the upper part of the Delaware. That's what we're calling it geography. It's the, it's, it, it, we're gonna look at the Tox Island Dam. And that was an upriver war that defined the river and birthed early on an environmental movement that has continued through to, 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 to today. And the context for this um, upriver war, I'm just going to quickly go through, and that's in the 1930s. A lawsuit was waging between the Delaware River watershed states and New York City, um, and it was over water rights. Everybody was fighting for a piece of the river. And that led to a Supreme Court decree and a compact that created an agency in 1961 that has had and continues to have a heavy hand in the Delaware River and its communities. And that's the Delaware River Basin Commission. And that has had good and it's also had bad results. And one of the bad things was the Tox Island Dam. And in 1962, a main stem dam was authorized by Congress after years of policy arguments about dams on the main stem river. They were damming rivers all over the West, all across the United States, and they wanted to dam this, this river. It was proposed to be built by the Army Corps of Engineers, and the use was supposed to be water supply, to control flooding, and for recreation. And the dam would span, this is a picture of Tox Island, and the dam would span the river at Tox Island between Pennsylvania and New Jersey, where today the Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area is located and also New Jersey's Worthington State Park if you've ever been up there. The lake that would be would have been created was going to be 37 miles long. So this it was a massive dam. Uh, and after the, or, the this authorization, a, a veritable war erupted. And you really can't use another word to describe what happened in the communities around the, uh, the upper Delaware. Um, that it was waged by activists, uh, river lovers, uh, farmers, communities, local governments, people from every walk of life, and it took 13 years. So this is a picture from Richard Albert's book. Um, it's an historic book called Damming the Delaware, The Rise and Fall of the Tox Island Dam uh, that he wrote in 1987. And if you want to dig more into this, it has fascinating stories that he tells there about the history of this fight. Um, but basically it was fought from the ground up, literally. Um, as you can see, these are so the typical sign that was posted on um, barns and people's houses and um, along the forest up there uh, for many years as this fight went on. And it, it is a, a really inspiring story and um, Part of the reason for that is because how they did it, but also they won. They beat the Tox Island Dam. So why did they win? 
Well, it's a story of one, and it's also a story of many. And pictured here is Nancy Shikaitis, and also a Lenape chief from the area. And Nancy Shikaitis was here um, as her family had been a, a founding family of farming in the region and been here for generations. Her farm was right on the Delaware River, where this right by where this uh, dam would go. And that's called the Minisic Valley. And she was a firebrand river saver. And she, she organized the first group that became the leader of this uh, movement to stop the Tox Island Dam. And people um, you know, that got involved um, had to be really brave. And at the time, there wasn't a lot of precedent for this. And one of the things that they had to do is not be shy about fighting the big guys because it was the Army Corps of Engineers. It was the Delaware River Basin Commission. There was very powerful political interest and even the National Park Service, which at that time was in favor of the dam and they were considered to be the enemy. They were condemning property in order to be able to build the dam. Um, but the people were determined and they proved to be more powerful than their opponents. And the dam was officially deauthorized in 2002. But like I said, it took groups and families and individuals uh, like the Delaware Valley Conservation Association, the Save the Delaware Coalition. Uh, there were squatters camps. There were settlements that were set up and people refused to leave for years as this was going on. There was a hike to Sunfish Pond. If you're a hiker and you've hiked up at the Delaware Water Gap, you've been up to Sunfish Pond. 2,000 people you know, back when there was no internet, uh, got together on one day and hiked up uh, with um, su the Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas to Sunfish Pond um, and uh, to protest this. And there were lawsuits brought, there were local governments passing laws. Um, and then finally, in the end, New Jersey Governor William Cahill and then Governor Brendan Byrne beat it, and they beat it on the issues of eminent domain, uh, the uh, tremendous cost involved, and then also um, and the environmental impacts because the water quality impacts were finally delved into and they realized that the dam would cause eutrophication. I hope you can still hear me because the rain is really loud on my roof. <laughs> anyway, safety was also an issue, but they won that and they won it from the bottom up and they changed history as a result. So the next geography of activism issue I want to look at is the Dump the Pump movement. And this, this movement um, was birthed at Point Pleasant, Pennsylvania. And it's what you might call a mid-river battle as you're moving downstream. It was in uh, Point Pleasant, Pennsylvania, across from Hunterdon County, uh, New Jersey. And it engaged river communities. And it really changed the political culture of Bucks County to all the way through to today. Um, these, this, the Dump the Pump movement was started in 1979. It was a proposal um, to build a project to pump 95 million gallons of water out of the, de out of the, every day out of the basin to fuel, provide cooling water for the Limerick nuclear power plant they wanted to build on the Schuylkill River in Pottstown, Pennsylvania. And the other half of it, where, or really one third of it, would go for development in Bucks and Montgomery counties. So uh, the sponsor of this was the Philadelphia Electric Company, and it was being carried out and built by a county agency called the Neshaminy Water Resources Authority, and it was approved by the Delaware River Basin Commission in 1981. So a nine-year battle ensued, and we did not win. That was lost and the pump was built, but the movement did work and it has uh, outstanding um, impacts today. And why did that movement work? Well, there was a lot of outreach, tremendous amount of outreach to people all, from all over, people who, who had interests for a lot of different reasons. Maybe they were against nuclear power. They didn't want it to be built. Maybe they were concerned about overdevelopment in Bucks and Montgomery counties. They were concerned about draining the river of important fresh water, the impacts on fish and water quality. So a lot of reasons that people got involved. But what the group did, called Delaware, is organize all of that. We did it really learning as going along, but also brought in 
expert organizers like Abby Hoffman, which was very controversial, and particularly at the time. And that, that organization resulted in tremendous mobilization all over. And at, there were chapters of Delaware and many, in like 10, 10 different chapters in different places. There were meetings constantly and, and it really engaged everybody with a lot of passion. And nobody gave up, everyone persevered because there were a lot of setbacks along the way. There were lawsuits brought, there was the Bucks County uh, commissioners were actually ran on this issue and won. There was a referendum that killed the project, but because of lawsuits that were brought by the Philadelphia Electric Company, um, finally they ended up prevailing in the courts and that's why the project was built. I was involved in this myself and I can, I can tell you um, right there on the right is the, the homemade information booth that I used to stand in. And one of the things that we did was constantly reach out to people, talk to people, give out information. And we used facts as our weapon. And it was really because of that and then laying it on the line, not having no holds barred, that we were able to actually wage a battle. We did end up cutting out um, about half of the water that was going to be used for development, but we did not stop the other half um, that would be used for development or the water transfer that allowed the Limerick Mount nuclear power plant to be built. Um, but civil disobedience was used. There were uh, many people arrested um, uh, as a last resort because we had lost, lost in the courts. So in order to try to prevent construction, people put it on the line. There were hundreds of people arrested every day and it went on for months and months. And in the end, um, we did not prevail in that. But environmental activism was like a fire and it began and people went on to be involved in environmental issues from that fight. So I never consider that to be a loss. I consider it to be something we, we learned from. And it was a, a, a fantastic community experience that really you can't get any other way. So today, well, I would say today we have a whole river revolution going on. And that's because there's so many challenges that all of us are facing um, in the future of our watershed, but also really a global fight because of climate change. And today, my organization, Delaware Riverkeeper Network, um, has been involved, of course, for years. We were formed in 1988. Um, and we, for instance, some of the things that we did that um, supported and carried through the activism uh, was in uh, 1990, we started the process of this special protection waters that I talked about, which means that the river cannot be degraded from the exceptional water quality that it now has. You can, you can institute special regulations under an agency, in this case, the DRBC, that Basin Commission I talked about. Um, if you are a wild and scenic river, there's a provision in the Clean Water Act. And we used that and started that in 1990 in the upper Delaware. And it took 20 years, but it, after 20 years, in, just at the end, 2008, almost 20 years, we uh, managed to get the entire non-tidal river designated so it cannot be degraded from existing water quality. And where there are hot spots of problems, it's required that it be improved in order to bring it up to the level the rest of the river is. And, and that has kept a lot of bad things from happening, I guess you could say is preventive regulation, but also we're working to, to try to address toxics and other issues in the Delaware to improve dissolved oxygen, oxygen conditions through a petition to the DRBC, to fight for fishable and swimmable in every stretch of the Delaware River, which we don't have and is mandated by the Clean Water Act. So we have active programs doing this today. That's why it's a whole river re revolution. And um, I think you know the, the important thing for us to remember um, as we face these big things that are happening, for instance, in February of this year, fracking was completely banned throughout the entire Delaware River watershed and it's permanent. Now that and the other things that have happened in the last years we have to look at because what we're not, not only doing is fighting bad projects, which we do all the time, we fight pipelines and compressors and fossil fuel uh, development, but we're also preventing. 
And preventing fracking means we have prevented millions upon millions of pollutants from entering our Delaware River watershed. And that will have an impact for not only us today, but generations going forward. So it's still not over. We still need to get a ban on fracking activities, the wastewater discharge and the water export for fracking. And we still need to fight fossil fuel development. We're doing that in New Jersey, for instance, through Empower New Jersey, um, through many different organizations working together day in and day out. Um, but what we're all really doing here, I think can be enshrined in this uh, section of the Pennsylvania Constitution is Article 1, Section 27, and it's called the Environmental Rights Amendment. And th the people have a right to clean air, pure water, and to the preservation of the natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment. Pennsylvania's public natural resources are the common property of all the people, including generations yet to come. Just think about that. As trustees of these resources, the Commonwealth shall conserve and maintain them for the benefit of all the people. That's the entire amendment it was put in place in 1971 by a forward thinking legislator in Pennsylvania. And we're working through, and I have a, uh, the last slide has a link, we're working through green amendments for the generations to have amendments to the New Jersey constitution, New York Constitution and the Delaware Constitution, and we're working in other states in the United States as well, but we want the entire Delaware River watershed states to all have an environmental rights amendment. And that's really at the bottom of what we're fighting for. These are indefeasible inherent rights, and we all have a, uh, have a right to them. But unless they're actually in our constitution, they're not recognized. And even when you're in the constitution, you have to fight constantly to make sure they're followed but it does give you the handle you need in order to do something. Um, now, the other thing I wanna mention is that everybody can be involved in this activist movement. Um, there, there's, no, there's no calling card, there's no application. Everybody can get involved. Everybody can be an activist. And one of the ways you can do that, for in, of course, is um, through the, the DNR Greenway Land Trust. The DNR Greenway carries out their essential work to protect the Delaware River by working um, to preserve and to care for the land of the Delaware River. And that's for now and for the future. So groups like DNR Greenway, groups like our Empower New Jersey Coalition, which includes all the major environmental groups in New Jersey who are fighting to stop fossil fuel development and for a clean energy future so we can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that scientists tell us we must do in the next 10 years in order to be able to stop global warming from being taking over and going completely out of control. So we're on the precipice of a lot of different things here in the Delaware River watershed. And many of those things are shared globally with people all across the globe. But the things that we can do really begin right here. And it's in this picture. It's at the Delaware River. And it, what, it is what unites all of our states. And we believe the connection with the river does unite all of us as well. So I thank you for listening to a little history here of activism in the Delaware River watershed. We have found looking at this history to be terribly inspiring. And we hope that you also got a touch of that by listening tonight. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Tracy. I certainly feel inspired after that. It's amazing to hear about all of the campaigns that um, that that happen to protect our watershed and protect the water that we drink, and you know everybody from the the humans that use it to all the other creatures that that need this clean water. It's really um, really amazing to hear. So we have time for a couple questions. Um, if anybody has a question, you're welcome to type it into our chat um, or you can raise your hand and I'll, I'll call on you to unmute yourself. Um, in the meantime, Tracy, I'm wondering, you know, it's so fascinating to hear about all these movements to protect the river. And I'm curious, how has the river changed in the time that you've been working with the Delaware Riverkeeper Network or, you know, even during your lifetime, it was, named River of the Year 20 in the, in the year 2020. So can you talk about that a little bit? 
Sure. Well, the Delaware River really itself has not changed that much over time. What we do see happen is the water quality of the river and um, the life that's in the river change. And that changes with how well we treat the land and the tributaries. So at times we've seen hot spots of problems. Right now we have, uh, and, and we have had really for at least a hundred years, a problem with some of the worst toxic uh, chemicals that we have, uh, ha have ever used as, as human beings like PCBs, um, PFAS also. Um, uh, all of the, the various chemicals, DDT, and uh, all the ones that we've used um, as people in order to manipulate the earth have found their way into the Delaware River and then moved downstream and have really concentrated in the estuary and bay. And cleaning that up is a tremendous effort. Um, we actually are frustrated. We think there should be a lot more money going into that and a lot more commitment on the part of governments um, to address those problems. We think there should be a lot more prevention because we're not just dress, uh, addressing a legacy of pollution, there's ongoing pollution. And we, we continue to struggle with that. I would say today, our struggles are more uh, focused on discharges of contaminants and uh, problems such as greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel development, which are having big, you know, massive environmental impacts, as opposed to the days when we were facing um, pollution from uh, mills um, or the cutting down of all the forest in the upper Delaware about 125 years ago, there weren't any forests left up there. They had taken it all down and, and, and put it on the river and shipped it down to make for the industrial revolution. Early, first of all, they did it for ships and then they did it for industrial development. And, um, then they stripped all the, the trees and, and made acid. Um, you know, there's just, there's a lot of insults and injuries that have been um, healing over the years. So there's been a lot of healing because those are now beautiful forested areas. Species have come back. We have a richness of endangered and threatened species, um, especially in the upper and middle Delaware. And we still have very important endangered species in the Bay and in the estuary like the Atlantic sturgeon and the short-nosed sturgeon and uh, freshwater muscle, mussels. These are species that are very special. We have an ecotype of Atlantic sturgeon in the Delaware that if it goes extinct, it will be gone forever from the earth. So these are the things that we're fighting today. We continue to fight to stop pollution, to clean up pollution. Um, and maybe the, the change has been that we have a heavier burden today because of what has been done tomorrow. But hopefully what we're doing today is gonna make our future generations tomorrow, not as um, as deadly as they would be if we were doing nothing. Yeah, and I love that clause in the Phil or in the Pennsylvania Constitution where it says we're you know it's not just us that have the rights to a healthy and clean environment; it's all the generations to come. Um, I think that's a really a really powerful thing to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. We have a note in the chat from Joel Dauschen saying, on behalf of Bordentown, New Jersey, we thank the Riverkeeper for preventing Elcon from building a toxic waste processing facility on the edge of the Delaware, potentially harming the Delaware and our precious air quality. Great work. Thank you. We worked with a lot of other groups on that. Well, great. If there aren't any other questions. Um, yeah, I got a question. Oh, there's a question. Michael, go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> thank you. Um, Obviously, I, I applaud everything that Tracy's talking about, and uh, I think it's wonderful. And, uh, but I did have one question the, concerning Tox Island. Um, obviously, the impetus to build the dam was the 1955 massive flood, I think, more than any other factor. So what, what do you tell people who, uh, who might say to you, um, what about the next 55 flood? Uh, uh, th there will be one sometime. Uh, luckily, the, the bad ones were in 1903 and really bad in 55. Um, so what do you say to them? Uh, 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 right. So uh, I... I'll give you the short answer because uh, I don't want to cut into C's time. And it's, uh, we could do a whole session just on this. 
Flooding is not controlled by dams. The only thing you can do is reduce flood damages. And the way you do that is not to build in the floodplain. And if you have historic structures in the floodplain, of course, you want to protect them. Um, but you, you don't build in the floodplain, which we do today. And you have big buffers around our river and water systems in order to reduce the amount of water that runs off the land when there is a storm event. And really, those two things, preventing runoff and allowing water precipitation to percolate into the ground the way it's supposed to be, yeah. leaving floodplains alone so they can act like the sponges they're supposed to be and absorb water, particularly when there's a high flow event, and then not building structures in harm's way. Get the people out of the way. That uh -huh. 1956 um, disaster that the people there were a lot of people um, that were killed. I think it was all, over a hundred people were killed at a campsite, and nobody really remembers that those people were on a tributary. They weren't even on the Delaware River, and if the Tox Island Dam had been in place, they would have still drowned. So this is the misinformation that gets thrown out there about how effective dams are at stopping flooding. They don't stop flooding. And the way to do that is what I just talked about. Was that campground Bulls Island? The campground you're referring to? No, I'm saying if they built the Tox Island Dam, it would right. not, if it had been in place, it would not have prevented the deaths that occurred on the tributary up around the Delaware Water Gap area. Oh, I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tracy. Let's give her one more big round of applause for that amazing presentation. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now we're going to switch gears a little bit. Our next speaker is C. Stroud. C. will be leading our kayak excursions up the Crosswicks Creek from Borden Town Beach this summer. So we're really excited to have her here to speak about some basic kayaking um, safety tidbits, as well as talking about um, the route that we'll be kayaking and how to navigate the river in a paddle craft. C is an American Canoe Association certified level three coastal kayaking instructor, level three trip leader and kayak rolling instructor, and is certified by the American Red Cross and Wilderness First Aid and Adult First Aid. So she's a really qualified professional to have along with us on our tours. She is one of the two highest certified women in Pennsylvania where she lives. She is serving her second term as president of the Jersey Shore Sea Kayak Association. She founded and runs the Penn Paddle for the Burlington Quaker Center, has served on the Delaware River Sojourn Steering Committee, is a former board member of the Lawrence Hopewell Trail and a former member of the National Canoe Safety Pro Patrol. C teaches ACA classes, private lessons, and also teaches for the Lehigh Valley Kayak and Canoe Club. C has been kayaking since 2007 and is an all season sea kayaker. She has paddled in the Delaware River from Hancock, New York to Gloucester, New Jersey, the entire 117 mile intercoastal waterway in New Jersey and a 32 mile Manhattan circumnavigation. Her paddle of the New Jersey intercoastal was published in the Bergen record. So with that, C, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, thanks Maria. Um, yeah, I do a lot of kayaking and I try and get other people to kayak too, in short. Um, let me share my screen. So uh, my talk is the hands-on how to kayaking um, the upper tidal Delaware and the Crosswicks Creek. And um, this is this is me here. Um, this is my boat. Um, this is winter kayaking gear. I do kayak year round. Uh, all right, so here's New Jersey, and it's kind of hard to see unless you add the Delaware River. Um, and this means that only this portion of New Jersey is connected to the rest of the country. So I don't know why, uh, why more people don't kayak, but um, I think they ought to. This is one of the kayaks that the program is going to have as a sit on top two person kayak. Um, if you haven't carried one, they're, they're rather heavy, but uh, you put one person on either side and that seems to work best. Here's another one, a single person kayak. 
There's also going to be some canoes, tandem canoes. And these are the kayak paddles. Um, these are low angle paddles, um, which means that this blade is rather shallow from the top to the bottom. Uh, they're good for touring. Um, if you can see the logo on the front, you have it in the correct orientation. Well, I should say the logo in the front with the long edge on the top, then you've got it right. Often I see them uh, backwards and, and that's not very efficient. Um, if you're looking at the back, for instance, with the short edge on top, flip it over. Okay, so um, head to toe, what are we going to wear? Um, it's a lot of it's a lot of personal stuff. So you need hats because you have no shade for the most part. Um, sunglasses uh, by ears, I mean. You need uh, eyeglass retainers uh, for your neck. Lately during COVID, we've been wearing gaiters that we can pull up over our face if we need to be um, close, like for a rescue or so on. For the torso, we have to wear a um, a PFD, which is the new version of the um, life preserver. A new word for the life preserver, personal flotation device is what PFD stands for. Um, on our legs, um, especially in the salt water, we, we try to cover up our legs. Um, but even in fresh water, the kayak does not cover all of your legs, so they will get sunburned. Um, which is a pretty funny looking sunburn. Feet, you definitely have to wear something on your feet. You can't go barefoot. There are pieces of glass, there's fishing hooks, there's sharp rocks. I kid you not, sharp rocks and you don't wanna step on these things. And of course, um, sunscreen, maybe some bug spray. Um, the personal flotation devices, are these are required. Um, there's three things that are required, and they are one of them. These are the ones that the um, youth are going to use in the program. Sorry, I keep this open on the side so I can see what's coming up. Uh, these are for the men, and these are for the women. Now, um, these straps here on, on this PFD, you can see them here on the side. This one has them across the front and the women's also on the side. Um, these can't be loose. If, if this is loose, the PFD is of no use to you or a rescuer. Um, this one in particular needs to be tight because um, this will cinch the bottom of the PFD around the bottom of your rib cage, which helps keep it down. Um, if, if you get in the water, actually not even in the water, if you can, Put your thumbs under these shoulder straps and lift the straps up to your ears. It's too loose. You've got to tighten the straps on the side. So you, you certainly don't want to be in this predicament in the water. Um, and if uh, someone's going to rescue, they're going to pull on this strap. So you don't certainly want the PFD to come up over your head. All right, so to what do you attach the PFD? I think I've been giving it away. It's gotta go on your person. It can't just go on the boat because if the boat floats away, you have no PFD. Um, another thing you have to have by law is a whistle. And most of the paddling whistles look like something like this. Most of them are orange. They're rather loud. They work when they're wet um, and you need to attach the whistle to your person, probably your PFD, because um, if the boat floats away, you have no whistle. And the third thing you need to have if you're out at night is a white light that you can shine in sufficient time to prevent a collision. This can be a flashlight. Um, there are like waterproof flashlights and there's waterproof kayaking lights, night lights that you can buy. So those three things again are the PFD, the whistle, and the night light. Um, I see this often with new kayakers. Um, they're out for a pleasure cruise and they're leaning back, they got their knees up, but this is going to make the boat less stable. Um, 
and it's very inefficient paddling posture. You actually need to lean, if possible, slightly forward and keep your legs out in front of you, maybe a slight bend in the knee. Um, some problems why I see with the paddles, this is an aerial view, by the way, is uh, people have their arms straight out in front of them. Uh, they should, if, if we're looking from the top, the hands should be slightly out to the side from the center. Um, from the front, what this looks like is uh, if you put the center of the paddle on your head and you're holding onto the shaft of the paddle, your elbows will be at a right angle. If you were to lift this paddle over your head, you have a V. And if you put the paddle down in front of you, you know, across your lap, it would, your arms would still be in a V. So um, we don't want this, we want this. So um, I think the biggest problem with um, kayaking is, is getting the word out from the very start that you actually don't use your arms to paddle you're using um, your feet and your torso, and basically your arms are just holding the paddle. So um, this is a proper stroke. So you can see the, the kayaker's shoulders are turned so that they can reach forward and put this blade in the water. And then when they draw this blade back, their shoulders are in the opposite direction. Often I see this where the shoulders are square to the boat. I think people do this to prevent tippiness, but it's, it's very ineffective and it's a very bad habit to learn. You don't, you don't just paddle with your hands or with your arms, you paddle with your whole torso. Um, and one effect of that is you get a longer stroke than if you just paddle with your arms without moving your shoulders. Can you see that? Um, although <laughs> some people will be in danger if they do the torso rotation correctly of pulling the blade out of the water too late and they're lifting water and that's counterproductive too. Um, and to go backwards, you don't actually turn the paddle over. You still use, you still keep the paddle in the same orientation where you can read the words across the power face of the blade. You're just gonna push the back of the blade towards your feet from your hip to your feet. All right, so we're gonna be paddling this um, bend in the river. Um, if I blow it up, this is where the Delaware River and the Crosswicks come together, um, right under Route 295. Maybe you've traveled this section. Here's a satellite view, right? Crosswicks Creek and the town of Bordentown. Specifically, the put-in is at Bordentown Beach. Put-in is a term for um, where you start your kayak trip and take out is where you finish it. So um, this is a dock here, this piece that sticks out. This is a parking lot that comes from under the, um, the light rail. And there's a tiny beach here where these scruffy trees are. Um, so we put in here, we go out around the dock if we're doing Crosswicks Creek that is, and we go up the creek this way. Can you see my cursor? moving on the screen, yeah, okay. All right, so um, if you're on the beach, this is your view, you get the underside of 295. Um, and I've noticed something recently, this is, um, I think this is Google Maps shows high tide and Apple Maps shows low tide. And um, I hope it stays that way, otherwise I'm gonna go and start doing screenshots of everything I need in low tide. So here you can see the beach is deeper than at high tide. And you can also see there's, this is a dock. I'm sorry, I think I called it a ramp before, but the centerpiece is a dock and there's a ramp on either side. Um, so from the Bordentown put in from the beach, we're gonna we go up the creek this way um, you can go around, but we go through here and uh, we'll keep going up to the Northwest and you'll notice the Creek keeps going this way. So you need to be mindful of making this turn, which is right here. And some nice person has put a sign there to alert you of that turn. Now, um, 
if you fail to make the turn or some some of the group fails to make the turn, uh, this uh, marsh is, you know, three, four feet high and you're only about two and a half, three feet off the water in a kayak. So the way to be taller on the water and be seen by um, your friends and oncoming motor boats is to raise the paddle over your head. So you've gone from three feet to 10 feet tall. So uh, once we make that turn and we continue um, towards this almost a butterfly interchange, um, right under here, there's another interesting view, which is this. And if I'm not mistaken, this is the light rail. Um, so if this is quite a, quite a tall distance, you could paddle under that with no problem. There's a really graphic picture to be taken here. Um, and we continue on up here to the, uh, the uh, there's some great, great um, plants along the way too. And there's lots of seasons of plants, so you can paddle this all year round. But uh, when we get to the end in here, you have um, the, I totally forgot the name of the house, the Watson House, uh, which is on the National Register of Historic Places, and they have a lovely garden. And then across from that is the Topahawkin Nature Center. Um, so, the river um, has some terminology for paddlers and um, specifically what side of the riverbank you might need to refer to. And this is kind of labeled in the same manner as an actor on a stage. So an actor facing the stage, you know, um, stage right is on their right hand side. So if you're paddling downstream, so this is the face of the river going downstream, um, this is upstream, this is downstream. River right is on your right-hand side, river left is on your left. If you're paddling upstream, it's the opposite, opposite hand. Um, and the same goes for the creek, as if you were facing downstream, this would be river left, this is river right. Now notice left, river left and river right share the same body of land, but these are two different bodies of water. So it's from the water perspective. So the upper tidal, is, uh, upper Delaware is affected by the tide. Um, it is fresh water until way down here. And um, this is a little pet peeve. So people say that the tide is coming in, but it's actually rising. Tide is an up and down um, phenomena. And um, here's, here's a way to prove it. There is no um, incoming tide business out there, but there are rising tide businesses. Okay, so um, when you have high tide, um, the creek is at its fullest. It's easy to navigate um, without running aground. Um, there's less drag on the bottom of your boat because there's significant depth in the water. Um, but at, when there's low tide coming in from the ocean, the, the river um, and the creek can have less resistance than they're flowing. And um, you, it's significant in the creek. In the, in the river, you can paddle, you can paddle against um, the currents rather easily, especially in a sea kayak. Um, in the creek, it's a little different. In fact, if you go into the creek at the maximum speed tide, uh, incoming tide, um, rising tide, sorry, uh, and you stop paddling, it'll probably move you at about an, almost a knot and a half without paddling. So there's two high and two um, low tides a day. High low, high low is the, the way it goes. Um, and they're about six hours apart. So six times four is 24 hours. Um, so if you have a high tide at six, you've got a low tide at 12. Now, um, what you don't want to be is up the creek without water. It's not this expression of up the creek without a paddle doesn't matter. 
when it comes to cross week, you want to be cross wicks, you want to be up there with some water because um, otherwise you could get stuck in the mud and have to wait for the next high tide. So how do we know when the creek is um, at high or low tide? We go to the NOAA website. Um, here's their logo. And these are all of the places in New Jersey that measure um, the tide. Now you'll notice the uppermost one is in Trenton. Now it's on the Delaware River, but you can use this to judge um, the tide in the creek too. So the difference between um, high and low tide is called the tidal range. And um, this is the NOAA chart for um, April 17th, which was the last time I gave this lecture. And um, the difference in the tide is, here's your feet. These are your hours at the bottom. Um, low tide was just under two feet and high tide was somewhere between uh, just under nine. So that tidal range is about seven feet. It's a lot. Um, so this angle on the curve, this is the, the flooding of the tide or the rising tide. And this angle going down to the right is the ebb tide or the falling tide. Um, so if you look at this chart again, are the high and low tides when you expect them to be? They're not exactly six hours apart. I mean, the distance between this low and high is shorter than this high and this low. They're not exactly six hours, so you need to be mindful of that. Um, we figured the tidal range is seven feet. And now the question is, when's a good time to launch? So um, most kayakers paddle two and a half, three miles an hour. So if you need to paddle six miles, you need two hours to get there. So um, this yellow bar is a two hour swath. And um, if you want to get to the top of Crosswicks Creek or the des your destination on Crosswicks Creek um, with the highest amount of water, you would leave two hours before high tide. Um, how, if you go in here just before then, this is the fastest you would see the tide rise. Um, but this will get you there right at high tide. And then um, you can just come back at these two hours when the water is, is um, lowering, when the ebb is happening, and that would be most efficient. Again, this is um, the fastest rises in here. So um, if you go to paddle the Delaware River from Bordentown Beach, there's some really interesting places that I've highlighted here. One's on river left and one is on river right. Um, this one here is an island in a lake in an island in the river. And um, you will find people in there. And then this one, um, I think this is an artificial cut. It is navigable, especially at high tide. And it has some really great plants. Um, this is taken. This is a guy on that island in the lake and the island in the river fishing. And this is in the other spot at high tide. There's some channels you can get here between the, um, the reeds and the, um, I totally forgot their name. But um, you also might wanna consult a chart. A chart is a map for nautical people. This is the, a chart of the Delaware River. Um, this is the compass rose and it shows magnetic north on the inside. This is true north. If you're bringing a compass with you, you wanna use this inside ring. Um, the cool thing about this bend in the river is the Borden Town Range. So um, right here's the launch. This is the Whitehall Range, but you wouldn't see that because you're going to get out, get in and out here. 
This Borden Town Range, this is tra still traveled by quite large ships. And um, there are markers in this channel for the ships and for regular motorboats. Um, what is my next slide? I don't want to get up track. Okay. And um, well, so I'll go back to that part. But um, so land is brown, water is blue, the channel's white, um, and this green stuff is stuff that is um, prevalent during low tide. So um, I don't know if anyone has heard of the Borden Town sandbar, but here's, this is a picture of it. So at low tide, this sandbar appears and people beach their boats and get out and walk around. But at high tide, it's underwater. So back to the range. So the range has these very cool markers that are right here. Um, they are at different heights. Um, they're white and when they are in alignment, when you can see them in alignment, you are in the range. So um, ships like this size use these for navigating. Um, but there are other ships out there, uh, smaller ships, little uh, personal motor boats. Um, this is, we're crossing from river uh, left to river right here. This is the um, railroad bridge in Trenton. So you do need to watch out for these motor boats. And um, the motor boats are gonna stay between these two markers. The reds are, are on one side and the green are on the other. They're gonna be between them. So uh, you wanna be, be between them and shore. That's your safe spot. Um, there's also these kinds which have a light on them and these do not. So safest place to paddle. I've exaggerated all of those these are called, um, oops, red nuns, and these are called green cans. Safest place to be is between these um, and the shore. So you, you wanna paddle up this side of the river. If you have to cross, go straight across, right? The fastest, um, actually, that's not true. You might wanna go a little on the up angle, like a ferry. And then you wanna be on this side between the shore and the green can. Um, so if you're coming back down the river, you have to make this turn under the bridge. Um, as a kayaker, even if the tide is uh, low and the sandbar is out, you can squeeze through here. There's a little sliver of water, um, but you don't wanna overshoot it here because if, if the current is strong enough, you'd have to paddle back upstream. So um, we're turning at red 88. They all have numbers on them. So um, might wanna start crossing back over here and make sure when you get to red 88, you're looking to make this turn back to the beach. Um, I guess my slides are out of order. I'm talking out of order, but those are those two channel markers. Here's an illustration of how they work. One is higher on the land. And if you're looking at them and they are in alignment, you are, you are right on the spot in the range. These are um, all illustrated in the US Navy Aids to Navigation, which is what a buoy is. All right, so if you're out of alignment, this is what happens to you, like in the Suez Canal, right? Your boat gets stuck. And um, this has kind of happened actually down in Burlington, this boat lost um, control of its steering and it ran aground on the Burlington side. It, it pushed up all the mud um, and it comes to a stop before kind of destroying the um, boardwalk. You can find this on YouTube. Just Google this bulk carrier running aground in Burlington. So um, there are plenty of hazards out there that you have to be mindful of. But um, overall, if you can keep this managed, it's completely worth it. It's beautiful out there. Very few people out of however many live in New Jersey get to paddle up Crosswicks Creek 
It's like you're on the moon. Very few people have been there. Um, and yeah, it's totally worth it. So I, I hope you get a chance to do that this summer. That's it for me, Maria. Thank you, C. That was a great introduction to our, our route um, that we'll be taking in the kayaks this summer. Um, for those of you who, I, you know, to make this clear, those of you that have attended all four sessions of this webinar series, um, you'll be given priority to participate in this on the water kayak excursion. Um, we're not sure yet exactly how many spots we have, so there's a chance that we'll be opening it up to other people, those of you who maybe haven't been able to attend all four sessions but have been here um, for one or two. Um, so that's really exciting. And we have time for a few more questions for C. Um, so again, you're welcome to use the chat or raise your hand and I'll call on you to unmute yourself. But C, I have a question before um, people start chiming in. You know, you finished your um, presentation by saying it's like the coolest thing ever to be in a kayak in these places that so few people have been. How is experiencing the kayak or experiencing the river from a kayak different from say, hiking along a trail along the river or, you know, being on a bridge over the river and experiencing it from land? Um, well, you might have a fish jump into your boat, which is really interesting. Um, and if you're wearing a skirt or which goes around your torso and over the cockpit of the boat, um, you could just land on the on the cock uh, on the skirt and jump around. That's not going to happen to you when you're hiking. Um, you're not going to see turtles up close. Um, I think you can see more eagles from the water than you can from hiking. Um, herons, uh, yeah, all kinds of fish. Um, I've seen. A, a little crayfish with one giant claw ones so that was kind of cool um i've seen a coconut in crosswick's creek <laughs> yeah so uh yeah different um i guess i know most of the plants i guess you could see from hiking maybe at least with binoculars but here you can see them up close and personal plants and plants and creatures we have a question from Bill in the chat asking for suggestions for resources to find put in locations for kayaking. Put in locations for kayaking. Um, you can use the boat launches, but you'll need a permit, the state boat launches. Um, under bridges is always good, although after 9-11, anyone near a bridge was highly suspect. Um, if you go, if you, you'd have to join actually the Jersey Shore Sea Kayaking Association to have access, but we have a launch directory. Um, if you follow any of the kayak clubs on Facebook, you can see in their trip descriptions where they started and where they stopped. That's probably the, the, the easiest way to not only find out those places, but to find out what condition they are recently, you know? Are they free of debris? Um, you know, was there parking? Was there a porta potty, et cetera? Yeah, read, read the trip descriptions on Facebook. Well, thanks again, C, for this presentation and, and telling us a little bit about safety in the kayak and about what the, um, what it's like to navigate the river from a paddle craft. We're really excited to get this, um, this on the water kayak program off the ground. Um, hopefully this July, July is our tentative start date for, for this program. So those of you who are interested in participating, keep an eye out for emails from me um, or my successor. I only have a few more weeks here at DNR Greenway um, and we'll, um, we'll see you on the river. So thanks everybody for attending tonight um, and I hope to keep in touch. Take care.